Jambu. Our ancestors originally came from the tropical rainforest. So the tropical rainforest, in a sense, is our Garden of Eden. And the gardeners in the Garden of Eden are the megafauna. The orangutans, the elephants, and occasionally the rhinoceros, believe it or not. The fate of the tropical rainforest is inextricably tied to the fate of these megafauna So do we need rainforests? Of course we need rainforests. We need oxygen. We need to breathe. It's a cliche to say by saving orangutans or by saving elephants, we are saving ourselves. But it's actually true. If we look at the long term, humans are very bad at looking at the long term. We want it now. Yes, yeah, so it's always very difficult uh, in our terribly busy, frantic and dangerous world to focus on non-human issues. But nevertheless, there is a massive crisis going on with wildlife around the world. And it's not just the charismatic species that we're talking about. There are a ton of smaller species that are also under massive threat and species that we don't favour quite so much. Evolution or evolutionary biologists might, some might say that we are, and certainly creationists might say, and certainly religions might say that the human being is the, is the pinnacle of evolution. Well, if it is, we are one of the stupidest species on the planet because I cannot think of any other species that goes around intentionally trashing its own home. So if we're the apex of evolution, then if there is a god, he made a real mistake. Once you understand there's no sharp line dividing us from the rest of the animal kingdom, and that we are part of the animal kingdom, and not, as we arrogantly suppose, somehow separated, uh, you then can ask yourself, well, okay, how is it that we're different? Because we are different. And I think it's the explosive development of the human intellect. And so how come that the most intellectual species to ever walk the planet is wiping out the other life forms, is destroying ecosystems? Because this, in the end, is going to lead to our destruction. So we destroy these animals at our own peril without thinking of the future of our own species. The real wildlife killers are crooks, criminals, and corrupt African officials who enable large and organized crime cartels to fill supply chains from African forests to Asian consumers. The real cause of wildlife crime is corruption, corruption, and corruption, is greed. The real conflict is powerful people, many times government officials, who are the ones in the heart of organized crime it's basically activating hundreds of poachers across many countries. The illegal wildlife trade is not rooted in poverty at all. In fact, poverty has nothing to do with this issue. It is, in fact, the rich and the powerful that actually are the part of this problem. These are people that have made reputations and made a very, very, very strong impact 
uh, in the world, and they've made that impact in a very violent way. They've killed people, they've executed entire families, they've bribed officials, they've put people in places where they can make decisions and impact policies and governments. You're not talking about, you know, your run-of-the-mill poor poacher who's running around with a 1947 rifle. You're talking about extremely powerful, extremely influential people in positions of power that simply snap their fingers and make people disappear. Why are you not just going in there with drones? I thought you wanted to hear the answer to the other question, which was a much better question. Okay, so the question is, are we losing this war? Yes, right now we certainly are. And, and it's not just that we're losing the war, the rate at which we are losing the war is increasing. There is evidence coming across my desk every day of the gravity of the situation. It is more serious than anyone can express standing here. It's certainly easier to say, well, it isn't that bad. I'm looking at a small portion. My job is to look at the big scale. I've worked in the field in parks. I've worked in countries. I've worked on regions. Now I look at the bigger picture. And that bigger picture is really serious right now. My interest in, in organized crime came from years of being a journalist, working in conflict areas and unstable areas of the world. And what I found was, no matter where I went, whatever the so-called problem of the day was, was predicated on crime and corruption. The U.S. government could have more impact if we go after the networks that facilitate all sorts of organized crime instead of trying to fight specific types of organized crime. There are far fewer people who know how to launder and move large amounts of illicit cash than there are poachers sneaking into parks across Africa. If we can stop the money, um, make it harder for them to move money through the global financial system, um, we're going to have more impact in shutting this down. And not just the ivory problem, but the human trafficking problem, tax evasion, the um, departure of revenues from corrupt and developing countries. There are all sorts of, of treaties um, that already exist that prohibit the extraction of natural resources illegally from Africa. Uh, we could be applying those to the wildlife trade. And we need to think about this as not just a ecological disaster, but a national security issue, an international security issue. The people who are moving ivory, the people who are moving rhino horn, are the same people who are moving young women from Bangkok to Africa and Europe, the same people who are moving drugs up into consumer markets. It's the people who have the capacity to move illegal products through the global transport system. And it's the people who have the capacity to launder illicit money through the global transport system. And so what the United States and, and pretty much every other government does is they stovepipe all of those different commodities and they give different departments the responsibility to deal with those different commodities. So we will have a department that handles wildlife, we'll have a department that deals with narcotics and a department that handles terrorism. And uh, the bad guys are all working together, you know. You never see a drug trafficker in Afghanistan uh, who says, I'm not giving that Al-Qaeda guy my heroin to carry, he doesn't have the authorities to carry my dope. No, they're all working together. Experts estimate 23% of all seized elephant ivory is smuggled through the Mombasa port in Kenya. It's a wide range of different kinds of groups. Some are groups that have been designated as terrorist organizations by the U.S. government. Some are rebel militias. Uh, some are organized crime networks. And some are actually state actors, um, military or police units that are taking advantage of the natural resources in the region for their own profit. Africa is not poor. It is being looted by commercial transactions through multinational companies, criminal activities, and corruption. The UN estimates Africa loses 50 billion US dollars annually to illicit financial flow. In the last 50 years, illicit money outflows have cost Africa 1 trillion US dollars. One of the biggest and least discussed problems in the world today is that the illicit extraction of resources from most developing countries is about 10 times what they get in foreign aid. So you're never going to get ahead of this problem until we can stop it. If we can stop the money, we're going to have more impact in shutting this down.
will be able to have much more of an impact against these violent networks if we go after them for their totality of their activities, for drugs, for wildlife, for people, for guns. I hear these going in Africa as cheap as $75. You know, better quality one, maybe $100, $150, $200, depending on what they are. These are not hunting guns, right? No, they're the they're, um, best gun ever made for shooting people. Yeah. That's what they're, for. they're for shooting people. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not a, um, it's not a competition gun. It's not, it's not really intended for hunting. It's really probably one of the most efficient guns ever made for shooting bad people. And that's, that's why they're so prolific in the world. More than 100 million small arms and lightweight <laughs> weapons circulate across Africa. This, this rhino horn here, it weighs, you know, six, seven pounds. Um, I don't remember if this is the front or the back one. I, I don't know that much about them. But all I know is this right here on the um, retail market is worth about $650,000. Um, that amazes me um, to think that because what that equivalates to is somewhere around 35,000 of these. When you've got $650,000 in that horn right there and you can buy a bunch of these, how much terror do you think this whole game drives? It's about a weapon bought to kill an elephant and then used to rob a bank. It's about entire local communities, poor local communities getting exploited by traffickers that arrive and offer five, six years salary. Of course they kill an elephant for, for five years of salary in Africa. They will do it here in Los Angeles. What we got here is uh, about a four foot tusk that came off 20 year old elephant. Um, this thing's worth about $400,000. You can see how that drives the problem. So when we're talking about the extinction of a species, I'm thinking of the cost in terms of individual suffering to highly intelligent and highly emotional beings. And to me, this is absolutely terrible. The sale of illegally killed ivory is being used to actually uh, enable terrorist groups to buy the weapons. The terrible massacre in Nairobi was funded by the sale of ivory. So the whole situation has escalated into something that's very frightening. It's not only impacting the elephants, but it's also impacting the, uh, the security of nations. It's incredibly important that people wake up and understand exactly what's going on and exactly the price in suffering that's being caused. The terrorist attack on the shopping mall in Nairobi uh, was a big eye-opener for a lot of officials in the Defense Department, in the intelligence community, in the law enforcement community, uh, that actually there was something to this link between wildlife trafficking and violence. Al-Shabaab could be defeated, but I think the United States and its partners could be smarter about combating the message that these organizations give. Uh, they shouldn't be engaging in extortion, kidnapping, all of that is haram, forbidden by Islam. Nobody takes them on according to the precepts of Islam. These guys who call themselves mullahs, who call themselves holy warriors, are actually just crooks. You got Boko Haram, you got ISIS over there, you got all these different people that are running um, child slavery, drugs, whatever they're doing. I mean, you got child soldiers. They're just brainwashed to shoot anybody that gets in their path. In the pictures I've seen, it's like, I mean, the, the elephants are, trust me, that's bad, but when you see what they do to children, it's like, huh. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, 5.4 million people were dead as a result of war-related causes as of 2007, and the fighting has continued since then. Joseph Kony has been active as the leader of the Lord's Resistance Army for a very long time. Hundreds of thousands of children have been abducted, enslaved, forced to do hard labor, um, raped, kept as sexual slaves, and we know that one of their most lucrative sources of income is trading ivory. They trade pieces of ivory for things like boots and bullets, boxes of bullets for a piece of ivory um, carried by someone who is forced to be a porter for hundreds of miles in some cases. Some of the products that come out of these organized crime networks are 
found in your cell phones and your laptop computers. That this is a personal issue because we are buying products that contain minerals that come from this region. Every one of us in the developed world has some kind of mobile electronic device in our pocket. And our mobile phones and laptops need tantalum. And one of the places on earth where you can find tantalum is underground in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And you had militias fighting over bits of land that they could control the mining in and use the money to buy guns, which has resulted in millions of people dying and the decline in apes, elephants and, and hardwoods. And in the illegal mines that are controlled by rebels, they feed the workers on bushmeat. If you're buying tantalum from the DRC, you are helping to fund armed militias who are raping women and, and using child labor to dig the stuff out of the ground. Animals belong in the parks. We don't have any connection between us and animals. Animals are for tourists, they're not for us. Yes, it has been like that for a very long time, but things are changing. People have started to understand we need to protect these animals. The biggest problem we have is um, our own local people don't understand. They have grown up with these animals in the past. They, they have lived with them. They used to kill buffaloes or rhinos and leave some to survive. But with the exit of the colonial, when they left, so they decided to have these animals in parks. The communities around those animals felt it is not up to our, it's not our responsibility to take care of these animals. It's up to the government of the day to do it. So even if they get killed, even if your poachers coming in to kill animals, it's up to them. So there's that disconnect. People really don't understand why there is such big fuss about killing animals. It's not a big deal. It's not a very big deal. Three decades ago, we had 24,000 rhinos. As now, we are 1,041. That tells you that a child who is my four-year-old son will not have a chance of seeing this rhino in the next 15, 20 years if something is not done. But most of the killings that are taking place, most of the rhinos that, are, that die, die inside the protected area. KWS is, knows who is killing rhinos in this country. They have admitted in the past that rhinos are dying and some of their own personnel are involved. What you can't get your head around is how poachers can manage to get to national parks. Last year, for instance, January last year, we had a family of 12 elephants killed on the same spot. 12 elephants. Among them a very small calf. The poachers managed to walk away with 22 ivory tusks. You can't do it. Ten of you cannot do it. 22 ivory tusks, 10 armed poachers with their guns on their backs. You have aerial surveillance, you have ground boots, boots on the ground from KWS ranges and reinforcements from other agencies, and these people get away. Something is very wrong. Something extremely wrong in this country. Yes. It, it's about uh, uh, tax evasion, it's about funds to terrorism and militias, uh, it's about money laundering. So the human toll is, is, is big. So the responsibility of China is also that. You know, it's, it's, we, start, we, we should start talking to the Chinese also about that, because it, behind the, an ivory trinket bought in China, there's someone, not something, someone on the ground dead. You have basically two fronts. You have the African front and the Chinese front, okay? The African front is, is complicated, it's complex. You have a lot of players all trafficking with ivory, with rhino horn, with other wildlife products. The second front is China. Right now, the single most important factor behind elephant poaching is the legal ivory market in China. It's very simple to understand. It's not rocket science, it's not happening on the moon, it's happening in China. So the legal 
ivory market in China is the reason why you have a huge illegal trade and illegal underground market in China. It's acting like a giant vacuum cleaner sucking up tons and tons of ivory from all over Africa. That's very easy to understand. And the solution also is very easy to understand. They have to simply phase out the legal ivory market. That's it. In China, Vietnam, uh, some of these rich guys grind this stuff up and snort it, make tea out of it. I don't know what they do, but they seem to think it makes their dick hard. You know, I mean, that's what they make Viagra for. I mean, come on. You need to kill a fucking rhino to get your dick hard? You got a bigger problem than you think. When we look at the, the commercial exploitation of wildlife, we always look, look at the whole chain. From poaching to trafficking to demand, we focus on all three major links on that trade chain. This legal market is providing cover for illegal trade, and it also confuses the consumers and makes them feel it's okay to buy ivory. In 2007, a CITES one-off ivory sale created an insatiable Asian demand which drove this global poaching epidemic. We found that 70% of the Chinese do not know ivory comes from dead elephants. In Chinese, elephant tusk is called elephant teeth. And so when it's teeth, people thought that, you know, a person's teeth can fall off and a person doesn't have to die. You know, I, I go to China every year. I have been for many, many years. And I didn't realize that so many of the Chinese believe that elephants shed their tusks, just like uh, stags shed their antlers. The Chinese people are beginning to wake up to the seriousness of the situation. It's important that people understand that the United States has been the second largest importer of illegal ivory after China. It's not enough that we're pointing fingers at the Chinese. We should look at ourselves and what we've done to Africa and the, what we owe the African continent for what we've taken from them. It's something that we as Americans have to take responsibility for too. It's not just Chinese who are suddenly buying all of the ivory. We have a long history of doing it ourselves, starting in the 1800s when we imported tusks. For what purpose? We had elephants killed in order to make billiard balls, the ivory keys for pianos, for knickknacks. Millions of elephants died for our purposes. Every elephant tusk represents the death or enslavement of five Africans. It is simply incredible that because ivory is required, the rich heart of Africa should be laid waste, that populations, tribes, and nations should be utterly destroyed. Whom, after all, does this bloody seizure enrich? When firearms came to Africa, that's when elephant numbers started to plummet. It is thought that then there were probably about 10 million elephants in Africa, now there are fewer than half a million. So we've lost 95% of the workforce of the forest that recycled nutrients disperses seeds and creates the forests of tomorrow. We're running out of time. Um, there, there was room for experimentation. There is no more margin for error. Uh, things are so desperate in so many places that um, either we fix the problem in the coming days, weeks, and months, and not even years, or it very likely in many places in Africa will be too late. I think a lot of nonprofits overwhelm their audience with doom and gloom. And so I think collectively we need to find a better way to disseminate this information. And again, get people inspired and empowered. That's why I think you still have to look for those gems of hope. And that's one of the reasons why right now I'm trying to focus more on the survivors of these poachings. Um, so what a lot of people don't recognize and realize is that not all poached animals die. So we actually have a lot of survivors on the continent of Africa. Um, orphan rhinos, orphan elephants. There's a whole new generation of animals being raised that have gone through traumas. Well, the one that's going to stop.
başladı Forward by Leslie Galdi Gacha Milyon Kundani And the Ruka <gülüyor> Well, all these babies have become orphans due to different reasons. Some of them, the mothers have been killed by poachers and due to increase in their trade on ivory, which is a real, real problem at the moment. Because normally, they're not found alone. They should be with their families. And some of them are orphans from human wildlife conflict, which means they've been separated from the mothers by human beings. There is um, an unofficial high mortality rate among orphans in Africa, elephant orphans. They're using these homemade recipes that no one has really properly researched or documented. Um, but I think there's more to the equation. I think it may be sort of a combination of medical, emotional needs, um, social needs. When you have a survivor of a poaching, whether it's an orphan who's witnessed his or her mother killed, or an attempted poaching. Sometimes an animal will have a traumatic wound, but they survive. What we see is that um, they have these emotional behavioral profiles similar to post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and oftentimes if we don't immediately intervene and sort of act as their, their mother figure, they give up the will to live. Um, so you don't always lose orphans due to a medical issue. Oftentimes it can just be an emotional issue. There's been an increase in terms of the number of orphans that are coming to us, which means poaching is increasing. But you know, poaching is not the only reason that is causing them to be orphans, but it is the main reason. Others are orphans from human wildlife conflict. They've been separated from the families by human beings due to increase in the population of man compared to the space or size of land and that causes the fights every now and then. The poachers want the big elephants with the tusks. Usually those are the eldest animals, the, the females, the matriarchs, the grandmothers who know where to go and what to do and how to behave. So when them gone, when they're taken out of the population, what do you have left? You have teenagers. You have. Just imagine if in your town, if all the adults suddenly vanished and all you had left were the teenagers at the high school or the junior high, how well do you think society would operate? You know, saving the world is not a part-time job and it is not without risk. We've been seeing things going in the wrong direction in most places for many years, and it's not just an issue that you can quantify with wildlife surveys. What we've been seeing is the collapse of the way of life that has served Africa for millennia, the relationship between people and the natural resources. You've got to save every one of these animals in the rainforest. You've got to save the habitat. But we've seen in a lot of these places that saving the habitat itself is not enough because Poaching is so strong in some places that it just cleans out whatever species are out there in the forest. And the elephants, of course, are a critical element in these rainforests. Elephants are the bellwether of Africa. As elephants go, so will everything else go. They're so big, they're so dominant, they're now so valuable that the best way to get a read on the natural state of an area that should have elephants is to go in and see if they're there or not. Usually it's not now. If they like to breathe, it's probably a good thing to save the forest, isn't it? Or maybe they don't think about that. They want a stable climate, you have to look at the integrity and the function, it's called ecosystem services. The elephants open up the forest so that new life can grow. They transport seeds in their dung. Chimpanzees do exactly the same. They take seeds and spread them around in the forest. Elephants uh, disperse more seeds individually of more species of trees and other plants further than, the, than any other animal. And they do that wherever they live. So 
50 countries, 37 in Africa, 13 in Asia, have natural elephant populations. Elephants in particular are unique in the sense that their digestive process is so intense, there are seeds from certain trees that will not germinate unless they've passed through an elephant's gut. So the reason that people kill trees in, 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 uh, in Africa is because they want the carbon that's stored in the tree as a fuel. Um, they, wanna, they wanna use it for charcoal. The forest is a, an extremely valuable asset that the government has to try and keep its hands off. If they don't, and that forest disappears, we will never keep climate to two degrees. If you value the forest, protect the gardeners of the forest. They are not ornaments, they are not things to go and see on holiday. Every gorilla, every elephant, every howler monkey in Latin America or taper are working for us, dispersing seeds for the trees of tomorrow. And if we want those carbon stores and those rainwater uh, generating forests to continue into the next century, we have to make sure that the seeds are being sown today to do that job. People think there's a forest and then you put some animals in. No, the animals and the trees and the bacteria are all part of that forest ecosystem. And one of the things that gorillas do spectacularly well is produce manure. A gorilla will eat and produce something like between 10 and 20 kilos of dung every day. That's about 100 kilos a week. In 10 weeks, that's a ton of manure being spread around the forest. And in that manure are seeds. Elephants are even more important as gardeners of the forest. If gorillas are gardeners of the forest, elephants are the mega gardeners because they're so big. When we're so taken aback by how powerful they are, we think they're indestructible. As human development has grown and elephant habitat has shrunk, the elephants are constantly coming up against people who are unfriendly, who are chasing them out of their crops, who are trying to defend their livelihood from the elephants, and the elephants are seen as an enemy. And that the latest manifestation of this that I've experienced is charcoal. Because for most families in Africa, they don't have electricity, they don't have gas. If they're gonna cook, they need either wood or charcoal. In many cities, the charcoal trade is a multi-million dollar business, which means anyone who can pay people a pittance to go and cut down trees, or even just branches of trees, build a charcoal kiln and bring out a few bags of charcoal, they'll be paid a few dollars and that charcoal is worth a lot of money in the city. The first day we went out in the forest reserve, we saw three charcoal operations. The elephants were right next to the charcoal and were obviously agitated. The matriarch clearly felt that we were posing a threat to them. She started running towards us. I didn't want to be hit from behind, so I turned around and I was rumbling, sort of a... As we do when we approach the elephants. She was really moving. <laughs> and I was still running backwards, still trying to placate her, when she hit me and I put my hands up to her face. Um, now, when I turned to, to face her, and then the camera hit the elephant's face against my hand. But that turned the camera off. And it left me on my hands and knees when I completed the backward roll under the elephant. And she started playing football with me. After five seconds, one of the kicks happened to knock the camera and turn it on again. A second later, you hear which is the rangers who had fired his shot in the air, and the elephant fled. She came to chase the humans away who were hassling her family. Now, in human society, we give people like that medals. growth in the human population and its footprint is a major threat, probably the single biggest threat to wildlife persisting into the long term, simply because it doesn't, it doesn't have to take all the land away from wildlife, it, has to, it fragments it. We take the best bits, we leave the worst bits for wildlife. Now, a population that used to live in a particular area is two populations separated by human settlements in the middle. 
so they can't uh, they can't literally get in contact with each other so one of the biggest challenges out there is the fact that the human population currently about seven and a bit billion people on this planet is going to rise to 11 billion people by the end of this century and the question then is is there room for wildlife there is an actual movement in conservation to focus on and population reduction in humans as an indirect way to improve wildlife conservation. So one approach has been for conservationists to teach population control and offer reproductive education to the women who live in the villages so they've seen the childbirth, you know, the, the growth has flatlined in those villages. The desert elephants of Namibia's Kunene region are one of only two populations of desert elephants in the world. The other is in Mali, North Africa. Approximately 150 individuals remain here. Why am I pessimistic? Just because of the numbers of humans on Earth. That elephants are disappearing and I can't just wave a magic wand or jump to action and save them. That's part of being wildlife biologist is you see a lot of death and you get to see the rare birth that balances out all the, all the death. It was a life-changing experience for me. I knew I wanted to work with elephants. We thought originally we'd go back to Zimbabwe and work there, but then Zimbabwe went extremely downhill very fast. Yeah. In Zimbabwe, you know, when our friends would go out on an anti-poaching patrol, <laughs> suddenly this was a military operation in the National Park where they would hand out the weapons and their lives were out there on the line. And so it takes that level of commitment of individuals and, and a commitment of, of society in order to turn it around. There are a lot of people that do value the elephants there. And then there are a number of people, like in any society, they won't appreciate what they have or had until it's gone. The bigger problem we're dealing with with desert elephants is not so much ivory poaching. It's attitudes of the people who live with elephants, who pay the price through destroyed crops or you know, untimely death of relatives or friends from elephants or lions, whatever it is. So we need people to go to Namibia, spend their tourist dollars, pay the local people to, to tell them about their lifestyle, make the elephants worthwhile to those people by sharing the wealth that we have here with those people there, and then elephants will be valued. In 2012, we went to Africa and we got to a village that we know very well. Just two days after one of our elephants, one of our known elephants, had been killed by the authorities for being a problem animal. And we didn't know which elephant it was, but we arrived there and all that was left of his carcass was an ear. I looked at my ID book of all the elephants and who's who based on their ear patterns, and I said, oh, this is M7, Mr. Sneaky. The local guy who was showing us the carcass said, no, the meat was given to the local people to eat. And he said, don't you like elephant meat? And I said, I would never eat an elephant. It would be like eating a family member. And he thought that was the strangest thing. We were feeling extremely discouraged and decided, we're done. Let's just go and say goodbye to the elephants, and we're done. The next day, we came upon our favorite group of elephants, the Tuskless Matriarch. And the teenage daughter, whose name is Dorothy, was showing some breasts. Dorothy starts to act very strangely, and all of a sudden out comes this birth sack, and push on the ground, a baby elephant is born.
We both said, this is it. How can we give up at this point? We're all in again. All in. <laughs> <laughs> We're going for it, laying it out on the line in order to turn the tide on extinction. Humans and wildlife compete for natural resources. Male elephants more often raid crops than do females in order to gain size and reproductive advantage. These crop raiders are then considered problem elephants. In case of human wildlife conflict, we always follow up. If an elephant comes into a farm and you kill it, you can't be charged. It's the only income that farmer might have for that year. He's relying on it to feed his family, he's relying on it to educate his kids, whatever. So in two minutes, an elephant will go in there and destroy a whole year's worth of crops. So you can understand why you get out of bed in the middle of the night and throw a spear at an elephant. So these are spears that we've confiscated off poachers. Um, again, they poison the blade, so when it goes in, it's not only the, the spear that does the damage, it's the poison that pinches it off. The worst is when you dig one out of a dead elephant. Sometimes it kills it quite quickly, I say quickly, 10, 15 minutes. Sometimes it takes days, sometimes months. Poisoning spears is a new thing. It never used to happen before. It's a new technique, um, but also they're using pesticides now. You know, they've ramped it up. There's pesticides available on the market, and you can just go and buy that from a veterinary shop. Soak your arrow or your spear in it, and it's more lethal than the traditional poisons. Human-elephant conflict is a huge problem in Lycopia County, and the, the levels of human-elephant conflict are probably amongst the worst in the whole of East Africa. We got a call from one of our scouts in the field who gave us some information about elephants being stuck in a dam. You had seven bull elephants who had crop raided the night before. And once we got closer, it became clear that these elephants weren't stuck at all, but that the community was actually holding them hostage. I mean, you had 400 people screaming and yelling in all directions, and the elephants didn't know which way to go. And to the arrival of this helicopter um, sent the population into a frenzy because they wanted to harvest the meat so that at least they would have something. People would prevent them from leaving either by shouting or by throwing stones and, and by driving fire towards them. This elephant made a desperate attempt to escape and it, it charged into the shallows now and you had an elephant on the run amongst people. This act of bravery I suppose um, encouraged the other elephants so they managed to to get out as well once the helicopter pushed the people and cleared the way for them. It's really tough for conservationists because people look at us and say, oh, you know, we only care about the elephants, we don't care about the people. This is not true, but these are the perceptions that, that go around. You can't ignore that human need in solving the conservation problem. This generation is, is the generation that's now in conflict for the first time in many, many, many generations. It's not a cultural norm for them to be in conflict with wildlife. They didn't conquer the wilderness the way the pioneers did in North America, perhaps, where there were dangerous animals that they were killed to make the land safe for families. 
if you can work with them to see the wildlife in the wilderness as an asset, there is still time. This challenge that wildlife faces now is not about changing wildlife. The group that has to change is the humans. Human-elephant conflict threatens elephant survival. Translocating or moving problem elephants is one conservation strategy. But translocation intensifies human-elephant conflict and increases elephant deaths. Another example of how we know elephants behave when they don't have their elders around is from young elephants that have been translocated. So they move in elephants that perhaps have seen uh, their family members culled, all, all of the family members killed in a park, another park in South Africa where they felt there were too many elephants. So they kill all the adults, they take the youngsters and move them uh, to another park. My name is Barbara Wiseman, and I'm the international president of the Lawrence Anthony Earth Organization. Lawrence had told me there was a troublesome herd. They hated people because people had killed most of the herd off. If I didn't take them, they were all going to get put down. So I said, absolutely, we'll take them. The matriarch knew how to push over an electric fence and short it out and escape with her herd. They had game rangers. The game rangers all had guns. Some of them were intending to kill them. Finally, the helicopter pilot got them back. The authorities just said, don't have anything to do with the elephant when they're in the boma. Uh, just leave them. And last time we did that, they broke out. So I figured, you know, somehow they have to learn to trust at least one human being. So he decided to stay with them 24 hours a day for as long as it took to get them used to him. And every morning, the matriarch would stand at the fence looking like she was going to make a break for it. If an elephant breaks through an electric fence with their body once, they realize that they can withstand the charge long enough that you can never hold them again. And Lawrence would stand just outside of her reach and talk to her. Hello, my baby beautiful. Hello, my papa. Hello, my beautiful girl. Yes, come on. Come on. Come, papa. Lawrence was staying with them. They were incredibly hostile. If they could have got him, they would have pulled him in and, and stomped him into the ground. So after three weeks of this, one day Lawrence described it as though all of the hostility turned off like you had just turned off a light switch. Just boom. Everything had gone calm. And the matriarch walked up to me and she approached me and I backed off and she stood there very benignly, ears down, and, you know, great emotion around her. And eventually I stepped forward to the fence and she put her trunk through and touched me. And I thought, well, that's it. I let them out. They could be a mile away, but if they heard it was Lawrence, they would come like puppy dogs to see him. Whenever I come back, the day I come back when I drive in, they'll come up to the house. The herd emanates something. They emanate something at a different level. Being in proximity to a herd, apart from watching the physical manifestations in their body languages, you actually get an emanation. The elephants had been living with Lawrence for about 12 years when he passed away. The elephants were about 12 miles from the house and they perceived it and they walked to the house um, in mourning, very, you know, sort of sad aspect. And when they got to the house, they were very agitated. They were usually very calm, very peaceful, but they were very agitated. And they stayed around the house for about three, three hours, and then they disappeared. Interestingly, 
Every year since then, on the anniversary of his death, they've returned to the house. You know, lions are not getting the attention. Um, it's up to us people in the field to try and stop the poisoning. It all, it's all about the cattle. People don't boma, uh, corral their stock properly anymore, so lions get in. There's a lot more cattle. There's a lot more people. So now we have a surge in cattle numbers, and when they start to invade the wildlife space, that's when you get conflict. And then, of course, people, if they lose a goat or a cow, they retaliate, and they go after the hyena or the leopard or the lion, and there are only 20,000 lions in Africa. Well, I was a surfer at the coast, and my dream of going into the bush and playing Tarzan and becoming a great game man, wildlife man in Africa, um, was sort of lost in the waves and the lifestyle. When I met Jo, I had written to her and said, have you got any openings? And she said, well, I have nothing going, but I know my husband is looking for someone because his previous assistant has just been killed by one of his lions. And I thought, great, that sounds like the sort of thing I want to do. When I joined George, his pride was down from 11 to 3. And amongst them, there were two females, Lisa, who was very affectionate, Juma, who you couldn't handle because she'd been very badly treated on capture, and Christian, the lion that came from England. Christian was coming up to two years old. He really didn't know what he was doing. I didn't have a clue. Christian and I grew up together and got into all sorts of scrapes, had all sorts of fun, and we taught each other everything we knew. They're very loving and they're... you can form a very close relationship with them, but you've got to watch it. It's an occupational hazard. You know, you... racing drivers have car crashes, and... You know, painters fall off ladders, you know, and it's no no worse than that. It makes for a better story. One of the lions that you guys were reading. No, it was part of a wild pride that we brought up when their mother died, not a lion we'd ever handled. But then eventually he got me all I could do was go fetal. I could hardly I kept sort of coming and going. Um, and then he got me through the neck and strangled. George did the most wonderful things because what he did, uh, with the respect and the understanding that he had for these wild animals and the way he carried it out, and, and just the whole toughness of it. I mean, there he was, day and night, you know, 365 days a year, out in the bush with the pride of lions. Um, and they're, they're lovely. So, I mean, I feel very sad. I never thought that in the short period of time, nearly 50 years that I've been in Africa, I would see wild animals go down, you know, to such low levels and, and, and be regarded in such a low light. It's just horrific how things can change so fast. Yeah, it's just people against wildlife and, and looking after wildlife isn't difficult. It's not rocket science. But you just you've got to make sure that if there's crime there's punishment. And none of the big boys ever go down that are behind this and you don't see any middlemen caught. Certain tribes punch way above their weight and just ignore the laws. And the attractively dressed people that the Western world loves so much are the worst offenders in, in, in all of this. Lions used to be poisoned with a very readily available cattle dip called Coopertox. Now they use an insecticide which is even more virulent called Furodam, which comes from America. It's meant to be banned, of course it, 
is. You can buy it anywhere. Um, and that, that's what comes with the increase in stock numbers. It starts with some lions going into an enclosure, the residue carcass getting spliced with this poison, the lions coming back, they get killed. Hyenas come in, they get killed. The vultures come in, they get killed. It's horrific. Lions and leopards in particular are very capable of jumping over and climbing into these enclosures. With leopard in particular, they go on a kind of killing phase. It's like kill everything that moves. The owner of that livestock is not best pleased, to put it mildly. Many of them will kill the offending leopard or kill the offending lion. Almost all these predators don't like people. Elephants don't like people. Fully understandable. We're the big baddies. OK, light for life. It's the deployment of an LED lighting system, a flashing lighting system around the periphery of livestock enclosures. These flashing lights actually represent human movement, activity within the enclosures. If you stop the predator going into the boma, then there is no need for retaliatory killing. Then they don't need to go out with a spear. They don't need to lay poison. They are prepared to accept living in proximity, as they have done for, for generations. For the last 15 years, I've run my own uh, safari hunting company, um, which is basically trophy hunting. I believe in hunting. I don't see anything wrong in shooting an animal. I don't necessarily say you should shoot a trophy animal. Why are animals trophies? It's a memento of the experience of the hunt. So you keep something from your experience because the trophy hunting fraternity likes to say that we're not just there to kill something. It's about the experience. It's not about the trophy. It's all about being in the wilderness and pursuing something. In many cases, uh, underage animals will get shot, even females. Females are not allowed to be shot. If you do shoot a female, it's a transgression of the law. Certain species are very susceptible to this, like a lion. Because in the field, it's incredibly easy to change the rules. There's no one around for miles, except the game scout who works for me. I pay him. You will do a hunt of 10 days. That's $2,500 you earn. 2,500 is a reasonable amount, I believe, for 10 days. Some people don't think so, so they rely on a gratuity at the end of the safari. And so the client would be, well, why can't I shoot that? So then the professional hunter starts thinking, well, if I let him shoot it, maybe he'll give me a better gratuity. You've got to weigh up your ethics and your morals within an instant in the field. Everyone brands the term hunters are conservationists. They are in that sense, but there's lots of hunters who don't stick to that. And look, mistakes happen. Lots of mistakes have happened to me. If someone tells me as a professional hunter they've never made a mistake, they're lying. I call them a liar to their face. You know, things do happen. Taking a photograph is you're just viewing, you're not participating in action. And the act of hunting is not about killing. It's about that participation in nature and with each individual animal. 
we as hunters tout. You know, hunting is conservation. You know, it's the best form of conservation. What I've seen in my lifetime is that our wilderness areas have just been depleted. So when you kill an animal, you don't think it's murder. You don't think it's essential. I cry. I've hunted lion, every lion that one of my clients has taken, I cry because I, I feel that it's not right to take that animal's life. He has lived a life like I have. When you're hunting antelope, there's thousands of them, so it's not a big event. The work and effort that goes into the hunting of a lion is worthy of the respect to the animal. For me, it's their life, especially a male lion. They go through hardships. They're survivors because they get kicked out of a pride when they're two or three years old. And they have to make it on their own. When you find a male lion that is past his prime, when he is nine, ten years old. He has been through so much in that span of time. Um, it's worthy of adoration. <laughs> it is so stupid to now go kill him. But, you know, that's what we have to do. That's, that's, that's part of the, the system. The very first elephant hunt I went on was with my stepfather and the number of elephants he killed is insignificant to what other people have done. <laughs> we didn't boast about shooting elephants. <laughs> Before that, you know, the great white hunters, they were shooting thousands of elephants. They'd cut out the tusks and cut out the heart and eat that and move on. Why do people want to eat the heart? I would not personally shoot an elephant just for its heart. But it, you know, that's the best tasting part of an elephant is the heart. But to go and kill an elephant just to have that, no, you don't do that. <laughs> With an elephant, once it's dead, it's a process. You start butchering the elephant. Now to cut through the skin takes maybe two hours to get the skin off. When you reach the heart, it's considered a delicacy, so you make a fire, you cut it open and you start cooking it on the fire. And you put a bit of salt on it and you start cutting little bits off it as, as you're working throughout the day. I wouldn't say I despise the trophy hunting movement entirely because it does serve some function to bringing clients to Africa. Hunting is not about collecting as many animals as you can and getting a gold Super Bowl style ring. And that is what the largest hunting club in America promotes. They want you to shoot as many animals as you can and then you become part of the inner circle and you get a ring. You get numerous awards before that. but that is not what hunting's about. The American hunter thinks, you know, my $100,000 that I've paid, all of that goes back into conservation. It doesn't. Wow, look at that. Oh yeah, we have, you must have boxes and boxes and... What are those? These are elephant hair bracelets. And where are they from? They are the hair that comes from an elephant's tail. Um, so they used to be very popular, but I guess nowadays there would be a social issue with wearing them. You'd get about 20 bracelets from a tail. Just this one bag would be five or six, right? Because there's a hundred. Right. And um, uh, there's that's 179 what, bracelets in here. That's what we see the most. You know, common thing on the elephants is they chop the tusks out and they take the tail. Those are the two parts they, they take. How old is that elephant? Uh, an adolescent. You know, they... Maybe 12, 12 years. Still a baby. 
it's not right what, you know, that they end up, an elephant ends up for this, to satisfy some, you know, put on someone's mantelpiece. That's not, it's not what they're, they're too majestic and special to end up here. In terms of uh, trophy hunting, um, I don't do that anymore. But you'll take people to Africa, so you're like a middleman for murder. Middleman for murder. I guess you could look at it that way. That's an extreme view, though. <laughs> because <laughs> the, the, the what, what do you call it? The, uh, the abattoir <laughs> murderous chain is already set up there. So rather have a good guy doing it than a bad guy abusing it. In Africa, it's a different situation with the trophy hunting because the animals are utilized. The finances, that, the money that comes in from the utilization of those animals gets put back into conservation, theoretically. But it doesn't. Who it, takes the money? The majority of the money that is made from trophy hunting remains within the government circles. I would say 70% remains within the circles of administration. Game numbers are often fabricated because if you have high game numbers, it means you can harvest more, um, you know. So the utilization of the money that comes from hunting, very little filters through to what it's intended for. It's intended to make the communities living within those hunting areas benefit, education, uh, medical, um, an upliftment of their lives for not utilizing that land. And secondly, the conservation of the, the animals, that money is meant to conserve people have become much more environmentally conscious, much more green, um, and in particular when it comes to something like, uh, like African wildlife where you, you read these shocking statistics uh, and, uh, and people want to do something about it. So when you're talking about $75,000, for instance, to hunt uh, an elephant or to hunt a lion or something like that, um, most of that money is actually going to the professional hunter. You've got the, the person from the United States, often is not, who comes here to, to hunt an animal, um, and he engages a, a, a hunting safari operator here, a professional hunter, um, and the bulk of that money goes to that individual, the, the 50, 60, $70,000, um, and only a small portion of that actually goes to, to the government in the form of the license that they pay for the, um, uh, for the right to kill an animal. So $4,500, and they share that between communities um, in the area of the hunting concession. Um, so it's, um, it's peanuts. You're not going to get hundreds of thousands of people coming to hunt. You're going to get hundreds of thousands of people coming to, to take photographs. Two things actually seem obvious, to me anyway. Uh, one is that there should be more of an emphasis on photographic um, safari tourism. Uh, and the second is that they ought to raise the fee that they charge these hunters to come in and, uh, and hunt an animal. And so over the span of its lifetime, a lion will generate three and a half million dollars in photographic safari tourism revenue. Uh, an elephant is something over a million. But the professional hunters have to come to terms with uh, the effect of poaching on their industry. Uh, there just aren't that many animals left anymore. What was the impetus to take hunting out of the safari business? You, you know, I have to go back many, many years. It, and really, it almost goes back to my childhood. Uh, I grew up in Africa. We all hunted. It was a, a thing we just did. We hunted the Maasai Mara, where the Maasai Mara Game Reserve is today. 
the, the climax of the whole safari was to shoot an elephant. You know, I shot the elephant, the elephant charged, and the elephant died literally within a few feet of me. When I saw this elephant dead, it was like a horrendous feeling came over me. Did said, you how, cry? How could I have done this? No, I didn't cry. I just felt, I just felt, I just like shock. How could I have done this? Beautiful animal dead. There's something about a hunt, if you've done it, which is very, very thrilling. You can't take the higher ground here if you're, oh, well, it's just terrible to hunt. You know? Why do people hunt? Why? Because it's thrilling, it's exciting. So they said, well, how can I have an exciting feeling about my safari, like when I was young? So I built the first camp in the world. You see all these tented camps all over the world? Mine was the first camp ever. And that was Wait, a... In Kenya? No, in the world. And so I hit America in about 1966 or 67 with a slogan, hunt with a camera, not with a gun. I felt like a missionary. I came all over and said, no, don't hunt. Have the, all the thrill of the hunt. The last minute, instead of going bang, you go pop, and you have a lovely picture forever. So they used to go and stay with all the people in Texas, and they had these huge trophy rooms. And, and I said, no, this is over. No, we're going on our next hunt, Jeff. We're going to do this. Why would you come with? I said, no, no, no. Then I've got this idea. They said, what a, that sounds so pathetic. It's a girl's thing. Girls do photographs. Men hunt. I said, no, 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 you have it wrong. So what was better, to hunt or to go into photography? Everybody ridiculed it. The answer was, of course, photography was the best thing ever. For every dollar invested in protecting elephants in East Africa, they get back a dollar seventy-eight in tourism revenue. Where all the guys used to go hunting, still running around their Toyota, shooting a few elephants, you know? People who hunt always claim they're the most knowledgeable conservationists on Earth. They say that if they weren't there, what would happen to the land? Would it just go back to cattle? They say that if we weren't there policing our concession, the poachers would come in and eradicate us from all that. When I was born, there were 500,000 lion in Africa. I don't know how many of them, but we know that 36,000 elephants are being killed every year. We know that. Just 20,000 lions remain on the entire African continent. The continent of Africa is as big as China, India, the United States, and most of Europe combined. So it's clearly not sustainable if you're going to be shooting an animal. So how can anybody look at me and say, I'm a professional hunter and I'm the world's greatest conservationist? There's something missing in their brain. And they've got to wake up, actually, because this is not sustainable. 50% of the trophies go to the United States. So we play a role in this also. Um, I, I guess I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm loath to, um, to put all the blame on any one country, um, but, um, but something's got to be done. Our role should be supporting what African governments themselves are doing, because if the African, if the African people and the African governments don't want to preserve the, the wildlife, there's really nothing that we can do from the outside. Uh, our job actually is to, is to convince them that it's in their best interests to, to preserve these animals for the future. We cannot tell local communities, oh, we feel that um, in America or in England that, uh, that it's really bad for them to hunt lions. They say, why is it bad for us to hunt lions? They destroy, they destroy, they eat our cattle. They're a nuisance to us. But if you can convince them, no, that land is no longer a nuisance to you, it's going to bring these amount of people, even if it kills a cow now and again, so what? This is what it brings in. And that's what it is. But it has to go to the people. The people have to get the money. did a study of the use of the forest by Baka people. The areas that were most important to the Baka people are the areas where the ape density was greatest. So when 
traditional dwelling humans in forests share their forests with apes, even if sometimes apes are killed for some special occasion, the apes do great and the forest is healthy and the people live there. The Baka people have over 15 words for elephant. If the argument is that we need the uh, wealth under the land, the diamonds, minerals, uh, petroleum and so forth, if you look at the countries which have the most valuable of these resources, in Africa, say, where they've been exploited already for a hundred years or more, these are still amongst the poorest countries in the world. So it hasn't benefited the local people. It is colonialism to remove people from their land, and it's also racist, and it's also illegal. And it's time to respect people uh, who have lived in these places uh, for essentially forever and to accept the fact that they have rights just like uh, we claim for ourselves. In Cameroon there's still parks being created and other protected zones. Some of them are for trophy hunting, so if you pay a lot of money you can go and hunt a forest elephant, for example, although that's actually an endangered species. There are areas which are adjacent to the parks which are so-called protected. Some are for logging, some are for trophy hunting. The Baka are evicted and pushed to the uh, edge and outside the park where they, uh, their society is entirely smashed. They turn to uh, drink, there are no jobs. Uh, it's not as if we're offering these people an alternative. Tribal peoples have lived on these lands essentially forever. The Baka, so-called pygmies, they are stewards of the land, they know how to look after it and how to look after the animals which they use, including the ones they hunt. We're stealing their land uh, in order to set up uh, parks uh, it, uh, to satisfy conservationists and for tourism. Lodges are built, roads are built. Uh, there is often harassment of the animals and that is actually extremely dangerous because it makes them more likely to attack people if people are outside the vehicles. whereas formerly they would have just run away and avoided people altogether. So it, it changes animal behavior. There are several layers of this uh, con trick uh, in conservation. One is that these lands are empty of peoples, when in fact they've been emptied of peoples forcibly, often to make the conservation zones. <laughs> Another is that uh, the outside conservationists are somehow or other better at uh, preserving the environment, preserving the eco-diversity than the people who lived there. And actually, there's almost no scientific evidence to support that. And the scientific evidence is in actually completely the other direction.
What we need to do is make sure that businesses are doing what people want. And what people want is to have a world which is um, looking after their interests, is looking after nature's interests, is looking after society's interests. One of the solutions that we can bring into this complex problem is around natural capital. And this model that we used to have of cutting it off, fencing it off, making sure that it was protected, conserving, that word conservation, is about protecting it and making sure no one goes there. That isn't conservation. Conservation is making sure we're understanding how dependent we are on it, the benefits it gives us. So the idea that we should have control over it, if we should fence it off, means that we have to keep on paying to protect it. So we work with the local people, we work with the local animals, the local species. If we can work with them, then it ends up becoming self-sustaining. Otherwise, we end up having to pay all the time to protect. We have to pay for rangers, we have to pay for protection systems. But we can only do that if we understand the value that is delivering to us. Otherwise, what is, what is the cost of doing that? How do we fit that into our conversation? The chimpanzees were really very helpful in um, helping me to convince, particularly the scientific community, but other people as well, that we humans are part of the animal kingdom. Because chimpanzees are our closest living relatives, and so when you then see similarities in behavior, it's pretty easy for people to say, well, yes, when chimpanzees kiss and embrace and, and hold hands and pat one another, uh, they're probably feeling similar uh, emotions to us. When you see a chimpanzee mother grieving the loss of her child, it's pretty easy to say, well, the way they feel grief must be similar to ours. Jane Goodall described a phenomenon that's found in Central and West Africa called empty forest syndrome. And it's where the forests are standing, but the wildlife has largely disappeared. Why? And the answer to that is through the indiscriminate commercial scale hunting of wildlife for bushmeat. Wire snares are set to catch, maybe they're set to catch uh, small antelopes, but wire snares will catch anything. Any animal that goes in that will kill itself in its struggle to escape. You have already got to two snares here, where they set their trap on the roots of the animals. When the animals are going this way, they're going to the water. So they nearly locate their seniors, where specifically on the root of the animals, where they usually go to water. What the poachers would do, they'd have a game trail, and they set it across the game trail like that, with this end attached to a, a tree. So the animal will come through, there'll be foliage put on each side to disguise it, puts its head through, and then it's just a slip knot. And um, as it goes forward, it just tightens. And as it pulls, it just strangles it. Sometimes they can take hours and hours to die. And why are they set? They're set for bushmeat. The bushmeat is then sold in commercial centers. Um, and the people who do the poaching are making a killing. A killing because they kill the animals, but also they didn't raise the animal. They didn't have it inoculated. They didn't feed it when there was a drought. Their cost is simply the piece of wire that they probably stole off someone else's fence to kill this particular animal. And the other thing is that bushmeat represents a potential risk to human populations. It could be riddled with anthrax. So bushmeat is a killer, in whichever way you look at it. If the hunting can be controlled to some extent, a lot of these uh, primate populations have a good chance of, of surviving. The big problem now is this largely uncontrolled bushmeat hunting. And it's not a subsistence issue. It's really, uh, it's a luxury trade where chimp meat or gorilla meat or monkey meat in the capital city sells for more than beef or chicken or fish in, in many cases. So uh, it, it's really, really hard to, uh, to control. Within remaining forest areas, the poaching, whether it's for hunting or for wildlife trade, it's just eliminating the vast majority of species larger than a rat. 
So you can go into forests in the Amazon, you can go into forests certainly in Central and West Africa where there's nothing. Nice forest, but nothing. This is an animated weather map of rainfall around the world. The white is water vapor, the orangey bits are storms. And every day it rains in the Congo Basin. So that big pulsing in the middle of Africa is the daily rainfall. We're all benefiting from the ecosystem services provided by these forests in the tropics. And the animals that play a keystone role in those forests need our protection because we want to continue to have this global water distribution system acting. It's a sort of a biotic pump. When we started, I was basically a journalist trying to write about extinction of apes. And it was very easy to see the consequences of this illegal trade in body parts of chimps and, and, and gorillas being sold to the rich and the powerful in Central Africa. It was also very easy to see that the law was never enforced because those that were actually behind those trade are the same police officers and wildlife officers that were in charge of applying the law. In fact, it was zero wildlife prosecutions for all the time the law was in place. And I went on research outside of the capital where, I, where people were telling me straight, hey, we have chimp meat being sold here and gorillas meat being sold there and we have also two live ones. I said, what is this wildlife, live ones? And these are basically the survivors of the bushmeat trade, the survivors of the killing of their entire family. So a poacher can kill different a family of apes, family of chimps, let's say. And then he would have a baby chimp. The baby chimp stays on the back of its mother for the first three years of his life. So if the mother falls from the tree dead, the baby dependent doesn't run away. He just clings to the mother's babe buddy and starts crying, poachers will hold it in his hand. Maybe he can kill it for the meat on it and sell the meat. Or maybe he can say, well, let's try my luck in the pet trade. So here I was in front of traffickers who were trying to sell me a baby chimp. Abused, tiny, one and a half years old baby, about to die. I went to the wildlife station and I said, listen, apply the law. There is a baby chimp here that can be saved. This baby chimp cannot leave me. So please, let's do something. Let's get the law applied. All they wanted was bribes. I knew I had to do something because all of this anger I had against corruption, lack of application of the law, it was right now in the face of this baby chimp. The following morning, I took the book of law, I went to the big house of these traffickers, and I showed them three years imprisonment. And they were totally unimpressed. And then I said, well, you know, I know that this is nothing for you, because with $3 bribe, you can get away with it. Then I started bluffing them, and I said, I'm a part of this huge, big international NGO, and we are here to fight corruption to get the law applied. That's my new job. And at that point, I just wanted to get rid of the baby chim. I untied him from his ropes, and I stretched my arm out, and he just climbed my body and gave me one big hug. Once I gave him a hug, he was again transformed back to a baby, baby with emotional needs. And that hug became a permanent hug because this baby chimp basically adopted me. <laughs> so I call this baby chimp future, and I realize at that point that I can actually fight not just for a future of a small one baby chimp, but for the future of a species, we are in the middle of a fight, a furious fight. But I can get a good night's sleep if I know that we got one more major trafficker behind bars, one more official, corrupt official that actually paid for his crimes. It's commercial gangs, organized commercial gangs of meat poachers, doing it for profit because it's something for nothing. Uh, and it's the big cattle barons. What you have to remember about East Africa is that it's the Wild West. 
You know, you ever seen a cowboy movie? What's it all about? You know, move west, young men, and there's gold down there. And, you, and in the cowboy movies, you see them with these huge herds of cattle moving. And in front of that stock, everything had to go. Native American tribes, wild animals, forests, rivers, whatever, was destroyed. And that's what's happening to us. So we're protecting gorillas, we're protecting elephants, we're trying to protect orangutans, but we're losing. Because when we raise money for NGOs, for organisations, to support the efforts of government agencies that are trying to protect these forests, we're thinking in terms of tens or hundreds of thousands. Bigger NGOs, maybe low millions. At the same time, corporations are spending billions of dollars to develop those same lands. And the ministers that come to our UN meetings and sign agreements to protect apes are often trumped by the more powerful ministries of agriculture and development who want the mines to develop, who want the roads to be put through the forest, even though opening up the forest begins a degradation that results in extinction. With elephant tusks and with, rhino, uh, with rhino horns, it's a more complicated issue. It, it really is, um, it's a war. Uh, a place like Kafui is kind of ground zero in that war, and the only way that the Zambian government is going to win that war is with, with help from outside and with devoting more resources it, itself. But I think it's very positive that the government understands that it has a crisis and that it needs to take drastic measures to address it. And certainly deploying the Zambian military to deal with, with poaching would be a, a drastic measure. Um, but it could be that the situation merits that, that, that it needs to, um, to take such a, such a drastic step. It's a question of them not caring about the wildlife. I think it's a question of, of, of them not knowing what is going on with their wildlife. I'd like to think that as proud Africans and proud Zambians, our life is more important than money. How can we get the community to be involved, to benefit from um, safari hunting so that they're not tempted to poach? We were sitting at the camp and um, I was sitting near the radio and um, a game scout radioed in to say that he heard uh, four shots and um, of course the, the game scouts were told to go and investigate what was happening and the game scouts went and they spent a night in the bush and the following morning they found the elephants and um, it was a long weekend, so I think that was a Sunday when the shots were heard, the four shots were heard. And the Monday morning, um, the Game Scouts reported, and we heard over the radio that it was reported that they found three elephant down. And so I jumped into my car and I followed the Game Scouts to go and see what was happening. And I took the pictures and I was so devastated. So this poor thing has been suffering the whole time? I was all weeping openly. The Game Scouts were horrified. I don't think there was not one person who stood there, including the Game Scouts that didn't drop a tear. It, it was beyond everybody. It was so, so sad. Especially that she was a lactating mother. She was a lactating mother with two small babies. The tusks were barely that size. They killed an elephant that takes a gestation of 18 months and then another 18 months to make a tusk that size. Even the Game Scouts were, were devastated. That is actual slaughter of an elephant that is 
put down, still alive, as the tusk is carved out of its face, purely so that you can have a trinket, right? It's beautiful artwork. This craftsmanship is exquisite, but they used a critically endangered species to do it. Wildlife crime is a crime that is very low risk and very high monetary value. It's currently estimated at a $19 billion industry annually. And the fact that the sentence really is just a slap on the wrist for people that are making millions and millions of dollars off of everybody's wildlife. Well, you know, the sad thing is, is they will shoot them in the knees to slow them down or to try to stop them from charging. You know, because this, you know, it's not likely they're going to get this into the brain, but they can get it into the legs to, to, to maybe make them stumble, fall, and not be able to charge them or trample them. Because uh, it doesn't take much to, you know, on what does an elephant weigh? A ton? Eight. Eight tons? That thing steps on you, you're dead, you know? So yeah, I would imagine that's probably, with, with an AK, that's probably their best, best effort is to just try to shoot the, shoot the legs to get them to stop. And then I don't, I, you know, from what I've heard, they just go up and they, they just basically take a machete or a chainsaw and it's like, man, I don't, how somebody could do something like that, I just don't know. The animals being driven to extinction affects everything. This is a, not an African problem, but everybody says poaching is a problem for Africa. No, it's not. No, it's not. This affects you. The current rate of uh, killing of elephants is actually worse than in the 1980s because the price of ivory has soared. You know, so many elephants, they're reckoning one elephant every 15 minutes across Africa. And this is completely unsustainable, so that some populations are already on the road to extinction. And if we don't stop this, this terrible uh, poaching soon, we may actually lose this most extraordinary and amazing of land mammals. I think we are coming to a cultural change here. One of those changes is collaboration. What we now need to do is have a re-renaissance of bringing people back together. We are part of a system here and not just some being that can control nature. We can't control nature, we're part of nature. What you do makes a difference. And you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. Dr. Jane Goodall.